Uncle Ted is Dead Written and read by John Catanch Turning over, I heaved the duvet firmly over my head. Saturday morning. No point in getting up yet. I need another couple of hours slumber at least. It's been a tough week, topped off by Ellie dumping me last night. But as they say, there's plenty more fish in the sea, and I'll be out clubbing this evening armed with my trusty rod and net. Not literally, of course. I close my eyes, but it's no use. If I'm going to return to the land of Nod, I'll have to siphon the python. Too many pints of lager last night hasn't helped. Reluctantly dragging myself from the warmth of the bed, I lumber to the bathroom. About time, you lazy so-and-so. You finally getting up. It's Dad, yelling from downstairs. I mumble an incoherent response. We're off to visit Gran and do the weekly shop. Can you wash and wipe the dishes by the time we get back? And try tidying that tip of yours. Do you even remember where the Hoover lives? Sarcastic as ever. Mumbling an even more incoherent response, I loiter behind the bedroom door. Dad opens the front door and that's when I catch it. The briefest of conversations, but enough to change my life. Yeah, as I was saying, love, Ted died last night. That's awful. Were you there? Yeah, right to the bitter end. It was terrible. Why didn't you tell me last night? Didn't like to wake you. It was well past two when you were snoring like a good one. That's all I catch. The front door slams and they stroll up the drive to the car. I hasten to the front bedroom window to ask more, just in time to see Mum shake her head as she gets into the passenger seat. The engine fires first time and they're off. Turning, I head downstairs. Any thoughts for lying are long gone? Did I really hear that? Not Ted. Wiping away a few tears with the back of my hand, I switch on the kettle, grab a mug and brew a much needed cuppa. My hands are literally shaking. And this time I do mean literally. I slump into my favourite armchair. Boris, our ancient tabby, jumps onto my lap and begins washing himself. Funny my life can be as straightforward and simple as his. I reach out, stroke his ears, and my thoughts turn to Ted, or Uncle Ted, as he's always been to me. Like Boris, he's been there ever since I can remember. All of my 17 years. The ruddy, podgy face, that shock of unruly red hair, wicked laugh, and deafening attacks of wind. He's not a blood relative, just one of Dad's mates, but what a character. I've never understood how he and Dad get on. One quiet and reserved, the other jovial, and always the centre of attention. They're so different physically too. Dad is rake thin, whereas Ted is well overweight. A self-proclaimed salad dodger with a jelly belly and a laugh to match. I bet that's what killed him. It was obviously sudden, and if anyone's a candidate for a heart attack, it's him. The more I think about it, the more likely it seems. Hopefully it was quick and he didn't suffer. It must have affected Dad too, otherwise he'd have woken me to break the dreadful news. Not when he got home, but definitely this morning. Then again, I seem to half remember a knock on the bedroom door just before I woke. I think I gave a hearty, convincing snore, and he must have chickened out and decided to tell me when they return. In my early years, I always stayed with Ted and Shirley when my folks went off on one of their regular holidays. They didn't have children of their own and spot me something rotten. I remember being quite disappointed when Mum and Dad decided I was old enough to accompany them. I did enjoy our holidays, but nothing could measure up to being with Ted and Shirley. They introduced me to the zoo, the cinema, the circus and so much more. We went out for meals pretty much every day, and sad as I am to say it, most of my fondest memories from that time relate to being with them. I suppose they had more money to spare than my parents, for whom every penny seemed to count. I was shocked when they split up a few years back. They'd always seemed so happy, but then Shirley was gone, to be replaced by a crescendo of whispering. I pretended not to listen, but got the gist. Shirley'd found another man, and Ted was devastated. For some reason, Mum sided with her. I didn't have much time for Ted afterwards. I never really found out why. I still can't believe it. Ted's always been around. He introduced me to football and often took me to watch the local teams. One of my best memories was my 11th birthday when he surprised me with a trip to Old Trafford to see the Manchester Derby. I never found out how he wheedled it or how much the tickets set him back, but he always had plenty of cash on him and was ever ready to part with it, particularly on me. Holding Boris off my lap, I rise and brew another cuppa. 
I considered making toast, but I know I won't be able to face it. My thoughts turned the last time I saw Ted. He popped in on Tuesday evening to pick up Dad for choir practice. As jovial as ever, he slipped me a tenner, and we had a chat about the Millennium Bug while Dad was searching for his jacket. I'm convinced that computers will stop working, and aeroplanes will drop from the sky at midnight on New Year's Eve. But he's adamant that with three months to do something, the boffins will fix it. Now he'll never know who's right. That's the last time I'll ever see him alive. I consider calling Dad on his mobile to get some more detail, but as I pick mine up, I see that yet again, he's left his on the dining room table. He really is hopeless. Eventually finding the energy to slip back to upstairs, I take a long hot shower to calm me down. I consider tidying my room, but one glance at the mess is enough. How can anyone face such a mundane task on a day like this? Instead, I lie on my bed and recall more of the happy times I spent with Ted. Time inches past slowly, but at three minutes to one, they finally return. Dad whistles as he turns the key in the latch. I can't believe it and scurry downstairs to confront him. How can you whistle on a day like this? Are you totally heartless? He turns to Mum. I told you he was losing it. What on earth are you rabbiting on about? If this is an excuse for not doing those dishes, you can forget about a lifted at town tonight. How can I even think of going out? Not with Uncle Ted lying flat out in the mortuary. What? What's happened to him? Don't lie to me. I'm not seven. I heard you telling Mum. I can't believe you didn't let me know. Dad turns to Mum, and unbelievably, they both burst out laughing. I stand, dumbfounded and transfixed. Between guffaws, Dad eventually gasps a few words. He, he's not dead, son. Well, not in that way. Not, not literally. You liar. I heard you saying he died last night. He did. On stage, you've right 200 people. There was no mic night at the club. You must have seen the posters around town. Mum knew about it. Anyway, that silly sod decided to convince the world that he's a stand-up comic. And he went down like a lead balloon. Oh, it was excruciating. Twenty minutes on stage and he hardly raised a smile. I didn't know where to look. He even told the one about the elephant and the cannibal. Oh, God, no. Yep, and the donkey and the sticky blue bob. I can't believe this, though. It's priceless. Wait till I tell him. It'll make his day, if not his year. No, you can't tell him. Of course he did. And I still can't live it down. I got the last laugh, though. Years later, I tried my hand at stand-up, and the story of Uncle Ted's death became one of my favourites and most popular routines. I did exaggerate the story somewhat, but that's what all the comedians do, isn't it? Ted didn't bench on stage again, but I know he's proud of me. I've even had my own show on Channel 4. You may have heard of me, Charlie Chuckles, the master of mirth. We still go to Manchester Derby at least once a season, and now it's on me. It's the least I can do. Ted's my biggest fan, and in a way it's all down to him, and hopefully he's got a few more years left in him yet. My hero. Not dead Ted. Ted.